try this out. So we're here and we're going to be spinning the August Spinner Surprise Fiber. We're spinning it into three separate one ounce singles. We're spinning them quite thin. We're making a traditional yarn. This is the 75% alpaca, the 25% angora, which is very beautiful. Um, I like, I've made this yarn as a four ply, which I gave to a friend and who gave me the alpaca and the angora. And um, then I made this as a three ply. And I think I prefer making the three ply because it's faster, but I prefer actually knitting with the four ply. So that's where we're at. And this is the yarn that we're going to make. We have divided up all of our hand carded roll eggs into three separate one ounce sections. We're going to join on our wheels talking to us a little bit today, a little bit of chatter, and that's okay. Just means it needs to be oiled. This is sticking though, that's not good. We don't want sticking. There we go. A lot of twist in this. So this needs more tension. It needs to grab on. If you saw, I was kind of putting the yarn into the orifice. This is the orifice of the spinning wheel. And it was not grabbing. It was not, the yarn was not joining on the way I wanted it to. And so, little bit more a little bit more tension we want this to really really we don't want it over twisted at all even though we are going to make a three ply so we are going to be plying it's going to lose some of its twist when we ply but it's it's still something we don't want to over over us uh, over spin the single so that's what we're working on right now it's just still not enough don't want enough tension. I really want it to grab this. Just adjusting, adjusting the wheel, getting it where we want it to be. And as you're spinning, if you have the Ashford Elizabeth II, which is what I'm spinning on, you know you have to adjust your wheel as the bobbin gets more full. That's normal in spinning, especially on this wheel. And So we're just, as you can see, we're, we're trying to spin a consistent single, a nice, nice lofty carded blend of 75% Wakaya alpaca, 25% German Angora, which really creates a nice yarn. Whenever I spin a yarn this light gray color, I always, gray is one of my favorite, favorite colors to spin up and make for yarn. But whenever I, whenever I spin this, I always want to make, make it into something like a hat and, and mittens. But this would make a wonderful blanket and decorative pillow. A lot of different things you could do with this yarn. They make this yarn, this blend of yarn makes really great um, bunny dolls, crocheted bunny dolls, which we have multiple patterns for at razzledazzlerabbitry.com. We also have um, a lot of different hat patterns. And when you think about it, fall is coming up already. There's some nights there's where the temperature has gotten cooler here. So before we know it, school is close to be starting, if not already started for some people. And then you have winter, which is really perfect yarny weather. So I don't know how long this one ounce will take to spin 
exactly. And that's okay. If you're spinning for production, you'll have ideas. You'll get used to a particular length of time that it'll take you to spin your yarn. And you'll want to stay within a particular range or faster because as always time is time is extremely important in your business Today, it was very, very foggy this morning, um, outside it's not even 9.30 and the, the weather feels like it's very humid, it feels like it, it's quite sunny outside, it, it seems like it's going to be a very, very warm day, and we won't have too many of these days like this left, this is kind of, you Around where I live, you start approaching the end of August, and these days, they'll become fewer. Fewer and fewer. So when I spin, I use my left hand and my fingers, and I just, I allow my left hand to feel how the single feels in my hands, feel for consistency, that tells me quite a bit. My right hand holds the fiber, and between the left and the right hand is, is my drafting zone. And my left hand, the way I spin this, my left hand, the left fingers really do apply quite a bit of pressure, and they do not allow that twist to travel through the left hand fingers into the drafting zone. It really uh, doesn't often do that. Later on as my spinning progresses through this ounce and if I start spinning another ounce, then um, I might relax my left hand a little bit more and allow the twist to come through my, my left fingers and into that drafting zone a little bit more. Um, but. When I start out, it's usually quite, quite, quite controlled. It's quite, quite a bit of tension in my fingers and my left hand. And when, when spinning like this, it's, um, you know, I'm spinning for eight hours of this. And if there's, if I use my left hand right here, I can get some fatigue. Um, so holding my wrist differently, you know, this I have a bend in it, flattening out my wrist. There's just different ways to hold. Uh, your left hand, hold your hands to uh, deal with fatigue when you're spinning for a long time. Just different things we, different things we work with. So I'm pretty excited about the hat pattern that I'm working on right now. It's a knit hat pattern, and it uses multiple different colors of yarn. So it's a pattern that is rabbits in the pumpkin garden. And I made uh, the first uh, version of the hat, and that's at razzledazzlerabbitry.com, a knit hat that is an image of pumpkins and rabbits that are have dug a burrow underneath the pumpkins and are just laying and relaxed. It's kind of a little, more of a fall type scene. And it's perfect timing for right now because it's uh, the end of, you know, the end of summer is approaching and it's a great time to start working on a fall hat. And this hat can, it's made with a double brim. But it can, you know, any hat that's made with a double brim can just be made with a single brim. The adjustment is made when, um, you know, you, you stop the brim halfway. So if it's a six inch brim, you only knit three inches and then you start the color work chart or whatever the pattern is for the hat. 
And so for a fall hat, a double, depending on where you live, a, a double brim might be a bit warm, but also depending on when you're wearing it, it, it might be absolutely perfect. And I prefer the look of double brim hats over the look of single brim hats because single brim hats are, they're certainly easier to make, they're quicker to make because you literally make half as much brim. But the single, you know, the single brim hats, it's a preference sort of thing. And I prefer the look of a double brim, but a double brim, you know, that is gonna add more, the extra layer of wool on the hat. But we have single brim and double brim patterns at RazzleDazzleRabbitry.com available. And they're, they're mostly bunny patterns for hats. There's quite a few different bunny patterns and I'm excited because there's going to be, you know, we're working on, I'm working on the rabbits and the pumpkin garden pattern, but we're also working, I'm working on more patterns. And they all just take, when making patterns, I'm quite particular, you know, making the hats, I'm, I'm quite particular in, before a pattern is released, I want to have made it as, obviously as best as I can. And sometimes there might just be like, that just might be adjusting a stitch or two here, the color of a stitch or two here to make a piece of the, the image better, more visible, more distinct, or to make it blend more, or whatever it is that I'm working on. So I may make a hat and really, um, you know, the pattern, when I make a pattern for a hat, the pattern has had a lot of time spent, spent on it whether it's just thinking about it or sitting at the computer and coming up with a chart for the color work or making the actual hat. But this year, you know, we've been, at the end of winter this year, we worked on, I worked on a lot of hats and produced quite a few new patterns. And of course, there was maybe two or three months uh, focusing on a few other things and then jumping right back into making the new patterns for the hats, which is great. Because after the rabbits and the pumpkin garden pattern, which I hope to be released by the end of this weekend, that'll be made available at razzledazzlerabbitry.com, uh, the, the next patterns will start out. And of course, uh, there'll be rabbit patterns which I'm excited about. Because one of the things I noticed is there are so many patterns for sheep and cats on um, Ravelry. Or, you know, when you when you go to Pinterest and you're looking at patterns, you go to Ravelry and you're looking at patterns and you're really, or you just Google search like patterns. One of the things that you just don't find as much of are rabbit hat patterns, winter rabbit hat patterns. And that was something that I wanted, you know, for my own, for my own search results, and I know others have been searching too. People want, people want to make hats with rabbits on them, especially you know people who are rabbit people. And the availability of the patterns just simply wasn't there for hat patterns. And there's all sorts of different patterns that I've made in the past in 2021 and you know made in the past that we're putting I'm putting up there putting on the website and so for people who enjoy rabbits that's that's definitely definitely a place where there's a lot of different patterns for rabbit things and the goal is to expand the goal is to have more so after Right now, we, I've been working on a lot of patterns that are sport weight patterns for knitting hats with rabbits on them and doing a lot of color work. But then after that, it will be switched to um, a little bit of, you know, different stitch work, different cable work. So there's all sorts of ways to make hats with rabbits on them. And if, if you're somebody who's not interested in um, as much a color work pattern, well, a cable pattern or a different stitch work pattern, that's something that you know, that I'll be working on as well and have available as well.
and it's sport weight patterns, like I said right now, sport weight yarn. Then switching it up and you know, there's, there's all the different weights of yarn. So when I say sport weight, it's the weight of the yarn. It's how thick or thin the yarn, the strand of yarn is. And I'll come up with about 13, which is a winter's worth of rabbit hat patterns, which is my upcoming collection that, of, of rabbit hats that when they're all done, it'll be the sport weight winter's worth of rabbit knit hat collection. And we'll switch it, you know, we'll switch it up from there. And there's, there's all sorts of different things. So there could be bulky weight is, is a fast yarn to work with. It's a fast yarn to make. It's a fast yarn to knit with, a fast yarn to crochet with, a fast yarn to weave with. Um, there's all sorts of different weights of, of yarn. And when I think about making things and I think of bulky yarn, when it's consistently spun bulky weight yarn, one of the things I think of is it, it's always wonderful for dolls, for kids, for making bunny dolls for kids using bulky yarn because it makes uh, a, a bigger doll. So if you use the um, any of the, the rabbit patterns that we have at RazzleDazzleRabbitry.com and you switch it up and you use a bulky yarn, well, you know, you come up with a bigger, you make, you crochet a bigger doll, a bigger bunny doll, and that can be quite enjoyable because instead of having to add more stitches, like if you use a sport weight yarn, to make a bigger doll, you have to have more stitches when you're crocheting. So if you use bulky yarn and use the same amount of stitches, then you have a bigger doll without having to add more stitches. And that's something that's quite enjoyable when I think of, of using bulky yarn. And with Christmas coming up, there's something wonderful and magical about having, sitting down and crocheting a unique bunny doll and using bulky yarn makes the doll a bit bigger and easier, um, easier, faster to make in some respects. It takes a bit more stuffing when you do that. And um, something I like about the bunny doll patterns, I've made a lot of crochet toy patterns uh, I've, that other people have written the patterns for. And when I would make the patterns, I would, I would always think to myself when I'm crocheting someone else's pattern, what do, what do I like about this pattern? What don't I like about this pattern? And for me, one of the things I always disliked about uh, crocheting animals was when the legs had to be crocheted separately and the arms had to be crocheted separately and the head had to be crocheted separately. And there wasn't a good way to, I, I wanted a pattern where I didn't, I had to do as little sewing as possible. I didn't want to have to, to take the time to sew the arms on later. And in the Razzle Dazzle patterns, that was something that I was able to solve in a unique way that um, there's, there's an easier method than sewing on, stopping after you're done and sewing on the, uh, the arms or the head or the ears or whatever. And the, those patterns, you know, they, they think about productivity and they think about efficiency in a business because the patterns are written so that if you own a business and you're looking for items that sell, these rabbit dolls, these patterns, which are, are my own, you can make these patterns and sell these patterns. Sometimes when you have people who have made patterns, um, they don't want you, when you make the item, when you crochet a bunny doll, for example, using their pattern, they might explicitly say, you cannot sell this item. Well, for me, it's like, you know, part of my purpose is helping other people in business and helping other people do what I do. And it's like, I made these patterns to be made as fast as possible. And I made them to, because these are dolls that sell. So if you have a business, these are items that you know, I've found 
people enjoy buying dolls, people enjoy buying things for their own children or for their grandchildren or for um, nieces and nephews or friends, children's friends, whatever it is. And so these are the, my patterns, all the razzle dazzle patterns are patterns that you can make and you can sell the finished products from without consequence. They're, they're literally designed and made for people who own a business who want to find things that they can sell, make and sell. Um, so that's kind of, that's something that is unique about these these patterns, which you know it takes time to on my end to do the the testing and the experimenting and figuring out what what actually does sell and crafting patterns so that as much as possible they're quick to make and that there's easy options. So you know if there's an Alfredo von Finkelstein rabbit pattern, a small crochet rabbit pattern that I have. And that is something that you can use sport weight yarn, you can use worsted weight yarn, you can use bulky yarn. It, it doesn't matter what yarn you use, you just make that, you crochet that pattern using whatever yarn and you can use the same pattern. So you don't have to, um, if you have only sport weight yarn, and th this pattern is written that you can use any yarn. And when I sit here and I think about that, that's something that in a business, you don't wanna be switching and flipping from, um, okay, I have 60 different patterns for a small bunny rabbit because I have different yarn sizes. You, know, you wanna be able to have some you want to be able to have some consistency and something that you can um, replicate. And then the cool thing is, like, once you start using the same pattern over and over, um, the, the, your mind remembers things. And it starts remembering, you know, putting it together. And that's very nice. So start memorizing the pattern, whether you, know, whether you want to or not, because you've used it so many times. So often when I sit and I'm spinning, I think about, you know, it's a time to sit and to truly just contemplate and think about things and to just enjoy the repetitiveness. And spinning has always been, um, spinning has always been relaxing, even though it's a job, even though it is something that has to be done for income, it, it's still enjoyable which is, I think in life that's, that's something, um, well, uh, Diana from Angora Craft had asked me, uh, you know, what I do and when I have free time. And I thought about that question for quite a bit. And what I realized is a lot of what I do is, my enjoyment of rabbits and fiber arts is what I do for work and in free time, really. So then I, it was almost difficult to come up with something that didn't involve the rabbits and uh, knitting, crocheting, spinning. Um, it was kind of difficult because the actual The enjoyment that I get from working with the fiber and the fiber arts is something that sometimes it feels like a job. There's parts that feel like a job, definitely that feel like work. But much of the time, it, it is enjoyable and it's something that's relaxing, such as with spinning. Much of the time, it's relaxing. Not always. Sometimes there's a lot to spin up. There's a time limit on when it needs to be spun by. Things need to be made. Um, we're coming into the, the busy time of the year, winter, fall and winter always start getting busy for yarn and fiber arts. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. 
seven roll eggs besides this one left. So this one's gonna take a while. So this will probably take over an hour for me to spin this out. So now I'm not spinning as fast as I can. If I want to spin faster to treadle, I'd have to treadle faster and I would have to adjust the tension on my spinning wheel so that it grabbed the fiber and wound it on the bobbin faster. Because if I treadle faster, it obviously spins and adds twist, more twist into my fiber. Well, to control for the amount of twist, I certainly need to adjust the tension. When I spun on the Ashford Kiwi, I, used to, I started out spinning on an original Ashford Kiwi and it was named Bob. And Bob was a double treadle, single drive. And that was, I found, an easy wheel to stop with my feet and start with my feet. And the Ashford Elizabeth II that I'm spinning on and that I have been spinning on for years now is a wheel that has, it's a bigger wheel, there's more weight to this wheel, and it has more momentum. So this wheel, when I'm trailing it, definitely does not stop as easy as the Ashford Kiwi did. It's something that the wheel wants to keep spinning, the momentum of it, it very much wants to, to keep going. Um, inertia, right? The whole objects in motion, wanting to stay in motion. And that's what helps make this yarn consistent, is the, the wheel itself. So the tools I choose to make the yarn that I'm choosing to make, they do matter. And I cannot say that enough because so many times when I was trying to find a combination of tools to make a consistent yarn that I was comfortable with for the types of yarn that I wanted to make, and when I would search for feedback from the general public, for example, from a Facebook group, the advice isn't always accurate. People would say, it's your skill level. Well, after years and years of spinning in multiple different uh, wheels, multiple different ways of preparing the fiber, multiple different, all sorts of different fibers, Skill level matters, and the tools matter. It does matter what wheel you use. Because this wheel, this wheel is not a wheel that is set up to make art yarns. So if I wanted to make a thick and thin yarn, this wheel, it's not designed to make a thick and thin yarn. It's, it's designed for the wheel to keep going, to keep spinning, to make a consistent, to help make this, this yarn consistent. And, you know, this is not a wheel that starts and stops and starts and stops. The Ashford Kiwi starts and stops and starts and stops. That one was great um, for making art yarn when I changed the, um, the setup, the flyer of it, and the bobbin. It was, you know, that was, that one was great when I put a super flyer on there, or I think that's what I put on there, a super flyer, it's been a while now with the very large bobbins because you could start, you could stop, you could really, really um, control the, make, make more of a chaotic type of twist. This, this twist, this wheel doesn't want to make a chaotic yarn. This wheel wants, it wants to make a consistent yarn and that's why um, the quality of my yarn changed with the different wheel that I was using because the tools were different. You know, you think about it like it's almost it's almost the same as saying, okay, cars are all the same. They get you from point A to part to point B. Sure, that's, that's true. Cars get you all all vehicles that are functioning will get you to point A to point B. But man, there's a huge variety in them. There's a massive variety in, for example, when we're driving one of the trucks to driving um, 
you know, the, one of the cars or the SUV or, or there's a huge variety in getting from point A to point B. And it's the same with spinning wheels. It's the same with the tools we use. It's, it's truly the same. And it's, yes, can you take an Ashbury Kiwi and spin a consistent yarn on it? Yes. That's, that's where, you know, skill is there. Yet, it is so much easier on a wheel like this. And, you know, you think about how you prepare the fiber and, and the type, the manner in which you spin from. So if you spin off the bunny or if you spin from a, uh, a bat, which is carded from a drum carter, if you spin from commercially processed roving, if you spin, whatever, you know, the way the fiber is prepared does matter as well in the spinning and the final, you know, the final yarn. And sometimes it's like, I can sit down and I can say, I want this yarn to do a particular thing. I, I want this, I'm going to sit down with this fiber and even though these are very, the very, the individual pieces of fiber that are in here, even though they're very thin, I can say, I want you to spin up and I want you to be a bulky yarn, okay? And I'm gonna adjust the way I spin this yarn to turn this into a bulky yarn. But the fiber has a say too. I, I don't just, I don't like to just create a yarn that I force the fiber to do and bend at, to my will all the time. I, I like when the fiber has an input. I like when it has something to say. I like when it says, I prefer to be spun like this. And I, so Angora prefers to be spun thin because it's a thin fiber. Alpaca, like this, prefers to be spun thin because this is a thin, has a low micron count. The actual width of the, of the fibers themselves, how wide they are, that it's thin. And it prefers to be that way. So spinning this into a, a bulky yarn may look like, okay, we're going to add six strands together of this. That's what we may do to turn it into a bulky yarn. Or we, you know, to me, that's, that's how this yarn, you know, applying a lot of strands together, this yarn would want that more than taking it and saying, okay, I'm going to make you into a single bulky ply of yarn, a single bulky strand of finished yarn. This yarn, this fiber, is, it doesn't naturally want to do that. So making this skein of yarn, just the spinning part, is going to be about three hours, an hour each strand, spinning for an hour each of these strands. And then it'll take uh, maybe a half hour around there, give or take, depending on how fast I fly the three singles together. So you have just the spinning and flying somewhere around three and a half hours when you start adding, taking off the yarn with a knitty knotty, washing the yarn, drying the yarn. Um, if you include the entire time it will take to dry on a humid day like this, um, I may try putting it outside in the sunshine to dry because even in the house with air conditioning, the humidity may be quite high, which will make the dry time of the finished yarn yarn longer. But uh, we can add on, you know, 
about two and a half hours for all of that. So now you're at six hours. So six hours for this skein of yarn that does not even include um, the hand carding and the, the weighing of all the fiber and the clipping of the angora wool and the, all of it. You know, you really start looking at a skein of yarn like this and it's easily for one skein of yarn a day of work to make one skein of yarn. And that's where, again, when you own a business, time matters. You know, you one three ply three ounce skein of yarn that sells for ninety to one hundred and twenty dollars for the skein. You know that's good. That's not bad. Except if it starts taking you longer to make that yarn. So if it starts taking you more than eight hours, an eight hour workday. And then you start looking at, you know, $90 for, let's say, a 10-hour workday. It's not that great. So the time matters. I need to start adjusting this tension. It's not pulling out of my hands as fast as I want it to. And so the twist is accumulating more. There's more twist in the strand. And I don't want this to be a highly twisted, highly energized yarn. That's not what I'm going for. I want this to be a balanced yarn. And still, that adjustment that I made, it's just, I can tell right now, it's just not enough for what I prefer for this fiber pulling. So we'll have to adjust a little bit more. Just teeny adjustments. Sometimes I over adjust. Let's, um, I'll turn my knob for the tension more than I actually need. Then I have to loosen it up a bit. And that's fine. If you find yourself doing that, it you know it just takes it just takes time with your wheel to figure it out and to figure out what, how much, how many turns or partial turns or whatever, how much adjustments needed to get the tension the way you want it to. Today I wish it was cooler outside and less humid because it would have been with the sun shining beautiful to spin outside. However, it's just not to be, especially in a long sleeve shirt and jeans, which is what I'm currently wearing. It's just not gonna fly if I go outside. That'll have to be adjusted. I look up what I was just doing is looking up at the camera and to the left, of the lens, there's a timer on this particular camera and it tells me how long this video has been recording for. And that's helpful for knowing how long it takes me to spin. So, I'm going to put both feet on the treadle. That changes how my treadling um, is going. I have and then I, you know, I can tell in my hands, I can tell just by looking, by putting both feet on, I can tell by the sound the, that there's an adjustment, there's a change that has happened. Just leave that fluffiness on there.
So I'm quiet because I'm watching what I'm doing. Even just adding another foot just takes me a little bit to adjust to how the yarn, uh, how the fiber drafts differently, how it behaves differently, how it pulls differently in my hands. And of course, this isn't, when we blended this with hand partners, hand partners this isn't a hundred percent completely perfectly blended Rolex of the Angora and the Alpaca. That's not what this is. There's spots of this where I had more Angora, Angora rabbit wool, and there's spots of this where I have more of the Alpaca. And, um, and you can tell when I get to those sections that, that weren't blended out as well, because they feel different. And oftentimes when I'm spinning, I end up with all this extra little debris. When I spin, I don't worry about properly taking something off and then properly putting it in the garbage. I That's not my preference at all. So the bits of hay, the natural bits of, um, if there's second cuts, those aren't things that I'm super, in the moment of spinning, super worried about placing them properly in the garbage. And so it results in my work area having a bit of vegetable matter and second cuts and you know fiber around so my work area that's a, that's a very nice way of saying my work area is not clean this is not an area that you walk into with your socks on and expect to walk out with clean socks if you walk in with socks on you'll walk out with uh, travelers on your socks such as little bits of hay and little bits of fiber and it's, depending on what I'm spinning, you might walk on out with like little pink bits of fiber, little colorful bits, or whatever it is. Which is why vacuums are quite useful. But it's just my preference for spinning. And that, you know, to have to go later and vacuum everything up doesn't bother me. To some people though, you may spin and you may say, well, I don't want to do that or I'm in a space where I can't do that. And you might just, you know, as you're spinning, you might have a little cup or a little garbage that you just put the items in. Or you might even have a towel completely draped against your legs on your lap that collects the matter. And then you simply fold up the towel when you're done and move on. And so that way it doesn't even get to the floor. But because of the way I spin, this just fits in with me. And, and those things, when you think about spinning, those, those things are just completely unique to the person who's spinning. Those things absolutely do not matter. And to me, it's, I don't know, I don't even know what the right word is. I don't know if the right word is frustrating or disheartening or irritating. I really don't know what the right word to use is in this situation, but when I, when I hear a really strict, rigorous uh, spinning instructors who, who require a towel to be placed on the lap, and I, I just, I don't want to spin with the towel on my lap. I don't like it. I don't like the way it feels. I don't like the extra, you know, I don't, I don't like the sensation of the extra bit. Especially when it's warm in the summertime and I'm outside. I don't, I don't want to be sitting there with something that's keeping me extra warm. But I, I hear if I hear ultra strict stuff, it's just not who I am. It's just not how my spinning is. It's just not how I instruct spinning. It's not. And some people, that's what they prefer, and that's fine. But it's definitely not something that is necessary to become a, a militant about at all. There's flexibility in it. And I think there's a joy in having many different spinners and many different ways of spinning and many different yarns that are created and many different people who prefer different parts of fiber arts because, you know, it's like, I know how to dye fiber. 
I know how to dye yarn. Is that where my heart is? Is that where my passion is? No, not at all. But can I appreciate and do I even purchase dyed fibers and dyed yarns? Absolutely. But it's just not what I prefer to make and that's okay. So I guess I would say, be wary of those who want to control every single aspect of your spinning experience. Some bumps coming into this yarn. Spinning with my left foot. My left foot, when I use my left foot to treadle, um, my left leg is, it just does, I have not used it as much in spinning. It's not as, um, it's not as strong. It's not as used to spinning. And so that's something I want to get better at. That's something that I work on is, is improving my treadling with my left leg. Because I want to be able to treadle with both and treadle well with both, treadle consistently with both. And right now, it's, it's just something that my right leg is my dominant trailing leg. That's, if I'm going to sit down at the wheel and start, I'll start with my right leg. I don't usually start with my left, if ever, unless something's wrong with my right leg. Alpaca joins pretty easily. The Angora can be quite slippery. Sometimes it doesn't want to join and stay as well as I might want it to. These roll legs are different sizes too. These aren't roll legs that are all perfectly the same size. So I may spin a roll leg a little bit faster than a, one might spin up a little bit faster than another, and that's just because these are different, they're different sizes. They're not perfectly all measured out to be the exact amount of fiber in the roll leg, which is fine. Focus is just set the task at hand. Just literally the fiber in front of me. And that can be very relaxing and enjoyable in the world or in a life that has a lot of screens in it. Which is a blessing and a curse. But we've talked about that before. My perspective on that. Real life is not sitting and watching this video on YouTube. Real life is not watching me spin the fiber. 
real life is when you actually go out and you start spending it yourself. That's what's real. I think sometimes it can be so easy to get stuck scrolling, scrolling through YouTube or scrolling through social media and looking at what everyone else is doing, everyone else's life, or the highlight reels of their life. We can get stuck doing that. And in the end, that's not really doing anything. And that's not really living. That's watching, that's being a spectator. But doing something like this, actually sitting and making something real, something physical, something you can touch, something that has a story, something that requires of you, it asks of you. Spinning is, it asks you, it asks you to, to learn and to try and to do. And it tells, your yarn always tells the truth. I was once recently texting, talking to my my younger sister about the yarn knows if you spin tense, the yarn knows if you if you spin angry or you knit angry or you do something, you know. If you're tense and you're knitting, your stitches are likely to be tense. They're likely to be uh, they're not you know, if you're relaxed, you're going to have nice, properly relaxed stitches. But if you're... Don't knit angry. You can't knit angry. The knitting tells the truth. The yarn will... It's the same thing with the spinning. The yarn will tell the truth. If you're bothered by something and you're all worked up or you're all stressed out, the yarn... The yarn will show it. It tells you. You may look back and be like, wow, I really spun that yarn tight. I was not in a good headspace spinning that yarn. You may look and be like, hey, that's pretty good yarn. I was nicely relaxed and enjoying what I was doing and having a good time. The yarn is a good yarn, nice and balanced. That all tells the truth. I think it takes a certain awareness to be able to to read that truth certain self-awareness to know and when you're spending hours and hours and hours with your spinning wheel and you're spending hours and hours and hours with your crochet hook and your knitting needles you can't help but spend many of those hours quite simply just with yourself and that's pretty rare. Because there's not a lot in life that we just stop and have that quiet, screenless moment. Have that moment to just be. Instead of to plan or to who knows what we do, I guess. Silly humans. Arthur is still in the house, by the way. And I'm not going to get this yarn. This one, this ounce is not going to be spun up in an hour. This one's going to take a little bit longer. Which is just fine. Because after this row leg, I have three left. But Arthur has been in the house for a very long time. Um, he's enjoying it. He has only successfully escaped once. And that was in the middle of the night when he just decided to hop up the stairs and he's extremely loud hopping up these stairs. It's not quiet. 
I thought it was actually the cat falling off the stairs and falling down the stairs because it was so loud and so much going on, so much chaos. But really, it was just, I looked up and it was just Arthur coming up the stairs, he was sitting on the floor upstairs, and then he did not want me to take him back downstairs. It's just what he does. He has preferences. And then he actually drinks out of his water bottle, like, promptly at 9 o'clock at night. And then at, like, 3 in the morning, he'll do it again, which is quite loud. So if you have an indoor rabbit, um, listening to a water bottle is quite louder than listening to a a water dish which is attached to something that can't be moved around because sometimes Arthur will throw his food dish around too which it's a metal dish on a slate tile floor so that really gets that really gets very loud and then when he does that in the middle of the night he has to get his food dish his empty food dish taken away because he's just making too much noise Arthur's been eating a lot of the fresh grasses, the fresh clovers, a lot of, he gets quite a bit of apples and pears because that's what's in season right now. We did not make a garden this year on this property. So they, like he does get carrots every so often that are store carrots. He'll get um, spinach or lettuce or, you know, just, for the celery, most of that is just store-bought because we don't have a garden. He does still get quite a bit of, he gets apple twigs to chew on. He always chews the bark on. He really enjoys that. Arthur will chew on any size stick for the, the apple sticks, the apple twigs. He'll choose, he'll choose the large branches, he'll chew the very small ones. When they're too small, he just kind of eats the whole little twig. Just, just fine. And this is just fine for rabbits that are healthy and that are used to this. If you have a rabbit that you're unsure, if you're not used to your rabbit, if your rabbit is new to you, if your rabbit has any sort of symptoms of the illness, you know, that's not the time to be feeding your rabbit a huge variety starting to feed a huge variety. Rabbits. Rabbits have a different digestive system than we do. It's definitely, if you own a rabbit, it's definitely worth learning about your rabbit's digestive system and how they actually digest food, how their little, how their little bodies work. It's worth learning about. Good to know. There's a textbook just called Rabbit Medicine that I recommend. So, I don't even remember how much that is. Maybe sixty or seventy dollars. Just not bad for a textbook. But I could be completely wrong. It's been a long time since I purchased that version of it. I don't even know if there's new versions out or not. I haven't looked into that. Sometimes when I'm spinning, I'll have, um, if I'm outside, I'll have the exercise pen and have the bunnies out. I have a, the, the height of the exercise pens actually varies. And so um, the exercise pen that Arthur is in is about two and a half feet tall, about, I think. And the one that, there's another one that was outside that I have left in the orchard that's 24 inches tall, two feet tall, a little bit shorter. Um, Arthur stands up a lot in his pen. And I don't, and because he has the, there's an inner little black pen that he goes in with a little roof on it that he can hop on. I use the taller exercise pen because when he sits on top of his little roof, uh, he needs the extra height to keep him contained safely because we have, we have a dog 
you don't leave the dog alone with the rabbit. So we don't, for our dog, we don't want that sort of chaos to ensue, which it ultimately would. Two more rolling left. We're hitting an hour right now. I'm gonna guess this little ounce is gonna take about an hour and 15 minutes or so-ish. Just guessing. But we're not spinning this very thick. We're spinning this, you know, we're spinning this quite thin. And it, when you spin a thinner yarn, it, it just takes longer than spinning a thicker yarn. So we were given some comfrey plants, which I did not take the comfrey plants from our last crop there. I did not dig those up. And the comfrey plants that we were given, we still have to, right now they're in a pot. We have to figure out, figure out where to place those comfrey plants in the ground. And I'm just not sure yet. Not sure at all. Because of course we don't have a garden set up here and that's where I would put them it is close by the garden closer by the garden maybe not necessarily in it or maybe in it I don't know but I feel pretty hopeful for the spring of next year to start out with a garden this year I had the seeds to put in a pumpkin patch, but we just did not, did not get to it. Uh, rabbits will eat pumpkin leaves. They'll nibble on pumpkin, pumpkin seeds. They'll nibble on all sorts of stuff. Sometimes they'll nibble on stuff whether, they, whether it's good for them or not. But we'll just save the seeds for next year, one year will not hurt the seeds, as long as they're nicely stored. Not too hot, not too cold, not too humid, not super, super dry. I think at some point, the battery on this, it looks like it's getting a little low. Because when I look to the left of the lens, I can, I can see how much battery is left. And the little GoPro uses quite a bit of, quite a bit of battery. So even though the, the memory card that's in this camera can store uh, quite a few hours of footage, if the battery doesn't last, well then of course the camera turns off and then you don't record and you don't get all the hours of footage you possibly could, which is fine in this particular case. So 
So I'm spinning at a faster rate than when I first started. And that's just fine as long as it remains consistent. So if you notice when you're spinning, you start spinning and trailing faster or slower towards the end of your, your spinning. As long as your single remains consistent, consistently spun, that's okay. You can adjust the speed of your trailing as long as it doesn't hurt the actual consistency of the single. Again, it's really just not where I want it to be for the speed at which I'm spinning and trailing here. It's just not pulling in the yarn. Of course, when I trail faster, when I spin faster, my hands have to move faster. No surprise there. join I might just slow down my trailing a little bit. When I'm spinning and trailing fast I might just do that. Concentrate a little bit, pay a little bit more attention to that section, that joint. If I don't I have a tendency to uh, have weaker joints when I don't slow down when I'm joining like that when I'm trailing fast. At some point, it would be nice to be able to consistently trail and not have to slow down with the join and just be able to join. But that will just take practice, like anything. It's all these small things. And then once you've been spinning for a while, you start noticing all these small things. And it's like, oh, I can get better at that. I can do that better. That can be better. And that's kind of part of the fun of it. Is it's never, there's always something to improve, always something to learn, always something to do better in spinning. It's never a completed, finished, done journey. There's always, you, know, you always have, you have something. Because there's a lot to it. Because it's real. Which goes back to what we were talking about earlier. Of course, when I think about real, it thinks, makes me think of the Velveteen Rabbit, that story. It's one of my favorite stories. matter as I'm spinning it's kind of coming out of the wall it's getting a little more and more loose sometimes when you're spinning the vegetable matter just falls down it just gets really loose in the wall that you're spinning and it falls right out of it sometimes it doesn't sometimes you end up spinning it into your single or whatever it is you're spinning and you have to physically take it out like right now that was about to go in so you have to take it out went into the drafting area, we didn't want it in there, we don't want it in the iron, we just take it off. But often on my lap, there's many small pieces of little bits of vegetable matter that just fall out. And that's exactly where we want them to be, not in the iron. And sometimes, like, that, that little piece just fell out. When I was twisting it, went above the twist and just was resting on the single and then flopped off. 
So just because there's vegetable matter doesn't in, in the fiber doesn't mean it automatically all goes into the yarn. It, it, it doesn't. But when I first started spinning, I, I was spinning, a, there was fiber that had a lot of vegetable matter and it took a lot of effort to clean it up. And as I continued spinning, I, I do not prefer any fiber that has a lot of vegetable matter. I really won't even, I just dispose of it and I get rid of it. I don't want it, or I don't, if there's a lot of fiber, uh, a lot of vegetable matter in the fiber, I really, really am not a fan of that. And some people are. Some people have the patience to pick through it and to sort through it and to clean it out. And that's something for me that adds too much time onto an already very time consuming um, time consuming task. So I don't I don't want extra time added to this. So I prefer just to buy or raise mostly clean fiber. There's always in natural fiber there's always something, you know, there's always some little bit of whether it's second cut or vegetable matter or whether there's, you know, a little bit of dander, there's always something. So it's pretty normal. This is the last of the roll eggs on the sounds. And after we're done spinning this roll egg, we will change out the bobbin. We have the lazy cake in front of us that you cannot see, but we'll change out the bobbin. Put a new bobbin on that'll be ready for another ounce to spin because we have two more to spin of this yarn. And then we can ply the three singles together. This fiber is available at RazzleDazzleRabbitry.com. It's the August Spinner Surprise. And that's a online monthly fiber club that three ounces of fiber gets mailed to you. So I would encourage, if you're interested in this, going and checking it out, getting fiber and just spinning it along with me. This is very nice, very nice fiber, which makes a lovely yarn. And Anita, the cat, is back upstairs. She's made many appearances in these videos. We're drafting fast. We're trailing fast. We're drafting fast. That means we need fast hands, fast fingers. Just got a thin section right there. Ooh, followed by a normal, very not twisted, thicker section. Boom. Boom. That's part of the fun of it. the battery, which is very, very low. So if you're spinning with me, you don't have to race. You can spin slower than this. Much more enjoyable. It's relaxed pace. Which this is not a relaxed pace. This is more of a production, let's get this done. single onto a different hook so it loaded onto the bobbin a little bit easier but we don't have much of this left we'll finish it up without moving it okay. 
after this, even though we have two more ounces to do and flying to do, Arthur needs his haircut too. So it's very good timing with the weather here that he needs his haircut now. And of course, when he gets his haircut, that means I have extra wool to spin. And as you know, we've been out of stock. It's hard to keep the Arthur yarn. <laughs> Hard to keep the Arthur yarn in stock with an out of Arthur yarn. It doesn't stay long. I love Arthur's yarn. I love his wool. It's absolutely wonderful. Perfect. Thanks for joining me and definitely check out this printer surprise at RazzleDazzleRabbitry.com if you want to get this fiber mailed to you and spin along.